couple of years ago, I took Aaron Sorkin's online masterclass for screenwriting. The course mostly focused on things like dialogue and character development and storytelling, but the most impactful lesson for me was how to approach story structure. Sorkin asks his students to visualize their story on a clothesline. And on either end of that clothesline is either an intention or an obstacle. For any story to work, there needs to be a character who wants something, the intention, and there needs to be something that gets in the way. That's the obstacle. If both the intention and the obstacle are interesting enough, then the line is pulled taut. At this point, the writer can hang anything off the clothesline that they want. Plot twists, conversations, side stories, you name it. But if the intention and the obstacle aren't strong enough, then the clothesline has too much slack. And then things like dialogue and plot twists start to weigh the story down. In other words, as long as the story is compelling, the writer is freed up to add as many colorful touches into their story as they want without losing the reader's interest. That's when you have them. In his masterclass, Sorkin says that he worships at the altar of intention and obstacle. And if the book, Every Blade of Grass, is any indication, so does Thomas Wharton. Despite being a page-turning epistolary romance, Wharton's novel is one of ideas. Scientific discoveries, the nature of life on Earth, quiet pulls towards spirituality, and a dozen other topics. It's jam-packed with interesting anecdotes and asides, but this book has such a propulsive momentum to it. For a book that teaches you a lot, it's really hard to put down. Why? Because Wharton's intention and obstacle are clearly defined and just sticky as hell. At the start of the book, scientist James Wheeler meets journalist Martha Geddes at a conference in Iceland in 1974. They strike up a friendship really quickly and end up corresponding via letter for the next decade because he lives in Vancouver and she lives in New York. It becomes very clear very quickly that James has some pretty strong feelings for Martha, but unfortunately, Martha is married with a small child, so James basically has to keep his feelings to himself. Through their letters, they just revel in getting to know one another through personal stories, through scientific discoveries that they make, through professional curiosities that they have. As a scientist, James has this fascinating approach to the world, and he's more than happy to share that with a willing, encouraging Martha. As a journalist, Martha is every bit as curious about the world as James is, and so the two meet on this intellectual level, which is basically all that they can have because Martha has a family. For each character, the intention is is pretty clear to, to be with one another, but the obstacle is Martha's family, or more specifically, her husband. And this is what makes Wharton's take on the epistolary novel so interesting. Typically, epistolary novels are about bringing two people closer together. They're about passion. But in the case of Martha and James, their novels are more about keeping each other apart. Both Martha and James seem almost wearied by the intimacy that their correspondence encourages. They avoid giving a lot of details about their lives. It's several letters before Martha even tells James that she has a family. It's several more down the road when we find out that James has this whole kind of environmental conservation career. Naturally, their letter-bound connection brings them closer and closer together, but each one of them does everything they possibly can to avoid falling in love with the other. As Martha's cousin Nancy puts it in the novel, the letter writing is kind of romantic, but it also keeps a person at a distance. But the two lovebirds just can't help maintain their connection because they're sharing things with each other that they're just not able to share with other people. Um, the things they love, the thoughts they're pondering, the questions that their lives bring up. They don't feel comfortable discussing these things with many people, even Martha with her husband. And so they each become kind of the one person this other person feels like they can talk to. And this is just where the novel soars and why I've been describing every blade of grass as a novel of ideas rather than a novel of letters. These conversations that they have are those beautiful pieces of clothing that Wharton is putting on his clothesline. If his intention and obstacle weren't so strong, if the impossible romance between James and Martha weren't just so agonizingly beautiful, I think that um, the amount of tangents in this book 
would have kind of weighed it down. Instead, I think they're the strength of the book and they're why Every Blade of Grass is just so fantastic. My favorite of these tangents is James's constant but enchanting brand of scientific introspection. Life on Earth began with an original single-celled organism, probably very much like the cyanobacteria that exists today. Over millions of years, this one primitive, tiny ancestor branched out, as Darwin put it in The Origin of Species, into endless forms most beautiful and most wonderful. We humans believe we're separate from other creatures, but we are what that tiny first spark of life eventually became, along with every other living thing that exists and many species that no longer do. Life has suffered catastrophic losses during Earth's history, but it has always carried on and flourished again and found new forms. I don't mean to say evolution has a purpose, that it's working towards some predetermined goal, for example, us. It isn't. If conditions had been different, human beings might never have been. But here we are, one of the many filaments on that single thread that began so long ago. In all these unimaginable eons, through all the struggles against nature's implacable forces, the thread of life has never been broken. Living things have lived and vanished, but life has never died. Digressions like this are just... They're such a big part of what makes every blade of grass so wonderful. Wharton's format, the letter writing, kind of allows him to write about anything he wants, anything he thinks is interesting. Many of their letters have nothing to do with their relationship. Most seem to be like the one I just read meandering thoughts about the nature of life itself. There's just this infectious wonder to James's worldview, and it kind of borders on, like, religious experience at times. I'm not a mystical person, pretty much the opposite, actually, but these islands can have an effect that's hard to describe in rational terms. Storms out of the Pacific strike the continent here first, in full fury, the waves battering the rocks with such earth-shaking force that in the morning, you climb out of your tent, amazed to find you're still on solid ground. Looking up, you see the towering columns of cedar and fir vanishing into a gleaming haze. When you hike inland, the quiet stillness of the deep forest is a little unnerving, or at least it seems quiet at first compared to the noise and activity of what we generously call the civilized world. But if you stay still for a while, you hear things that were there all along. The faint stir and creak and rustle of a living forest. The sounds that make up what we urbanites call silence. If not spiritual, there's something reverential about the way Wharton talks about the world. That stillness that James was talking about reminds me an awful lot of the quiet hum that New Age religious people talk about when they talk about their relationship with God. Like James, I'm not a mystical person, uh, I'm pretty much the opposite, but it's pretty hard not to feel inspired by where we are and what we're made of. All I wanted to do while I read this book was go outside. It's, it's impossible to me to read every blade of grass and not feel activated in some way. These moments felt so much more important to me than the frame story, but that being said, the story is so beautiful and it's one of the most um, charming romances that I've read in quite a long time. However, a review for every blade of grass would be incomplete if I didn't mention how sad that romance can be and often is. Unrequited love can be really hard to take and a few of the turns in this book go from dark to darker. But mercifully, Wharton finds a way to shine a little light in. My favorite example of that being one of the letters Wharton talks about the Japanese art of kintsugi. This involves mending broken pottery with lacquer mixed with gold or silver to make something more beautiful than it was before. The idea is that you don't try to hide the damage to an object, you make it a part of its history. This idea plays a huge role in James and Martha's relationship and it's important that they make the bad times of this story part of their story. It's a feature, it's not a bug. They embrace their bad times. They 
recognize them as a part of their history. There's no judgment, it's just reflection. It's so important, as is so much of this novel. Unfortunately, though, Every Blade of Grass is not an easy novel to find, at least not in print. And that's what happens when an author kind of goes rogue and decides to self-publish eight books into his career. Wharton said that he decided to self-publish because he wanted to um, learn how to do all this stuff by himself, but he also wanted freedom. After writing six, seven, eight books, he finally wanted to be in control of the whole process. So he designed his own cover, he edited his own manuscript, he even promoted it by himself. He even put together a soundtrack for the book, complete with descriptions of each song and how they fit into the story, which I'll link below because it's a pretty cool idea. Unfortunately, what he gained in old-fashioned know-how, he probably lost in readership. Um, if you're an e-reader, you're in luck. This book is, is very easy to find on e-readers, but if you're looking for a physical copy of the book, it had a very limited print run from what I understand. Um, and so it can be pretty difficult to find. This book doesn't come with fancy author blurbs, even though it could have. It doesn't have this long list of awards that it won, which it could have. Wharton's won a bunch of awards in the past, but independently published books very rarely win these things. So I'm asking you as a reader if this sounded interesting to you. Trust your instincts and maybe a favorite booktuber that you might have. As always, thank you so much for stopping by, you guys. My name is Rick. I don't know if I said that at the start of the video, but uh, yeah, please go out and check out Every Blade of Grass. It's wonderful. Thomas Warden's wonderful. I promise you, Every Blade of Grass is well, well worth your time.